what I plan to do is to talk about an issue which is uh, quite timely in the UK, <coughs> the sort of uh, process of trying to get a uh, community to volunteer to host a geological repository for radioactive waste. <coughs> it's actually um, proving problematic in the UK for reasons that will become apparent. What I also need to do is to show you this slide, um, which is because I'm a, a member of the Committee on Radioactive Waste Management, uh, I, have to, I have to put this slide up and then I can say what I like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an outline of the talk. Um, so I'll give you a bit of background to the uh, UK's MRWF process. Um, I'll, I'll highlight the, the wonderful uh, cornucopia of wastes that the UK has uh, uh, detail our inventory. I'll talk about some technical issues, the Sellafield legacy ponds and silos, uh, which are a, a challenge, to say the least, in the UK. I'll talk a little about um, what happens uh, with the waste forms once we've packaged them, and, and concerns about their stability and durability, both in store and in a disposal environment, and the sort of progress that we've been making towards geological disposal, um, and, and what the state of play in the UK is. So that's the plan. We'll see how we get on. Um, this is the location of the UK's uh, radioactive waste. So this is where people who <coughs> some interest or, or uh, originally came from the UK look to see where uh, the waste is close to them. Um, I actually now live down here, so I'm in a sort of waste-free area. Um, most, most of the UK waste is up around Sellafield. There's quite a high proportion up at uh, Doomray in the northeast of, of uh, Scotland. Uh, but it's dotted around various reactors and uh, research sites and other establishments in the UK. <coughs> This is a sort of summary of the waste that we have, various types here, um, including uh, low-level intermediate, high-level waste, quite high volumes here. This is, this is a new build spent fuel, so we're, we're sort of assuming that we will build some reactors, and uh, if we do, we'll get this much waste from them. Some of these materials are, uh, have not been declared as wastes um, yet. Uh, but certainly some of them will be before too long. So we've got a grand total of 665,000 cubic metres or so. Uh, and I had one of my students paste round St. Paul's Cathedral uh, and do the sums, and, and we worked out that that's about half a million uh, cubic metres. So you can see we've got quite a lot of uh, radioactive waste. And also lots of different types. Uh, so we reprocess and uh, dissolve spent fuel in nitric acid and, and get out the, the good things and, and the bad things. Uh, the calcined product of that reprocessing is, is immobilised in uh, alkali borosilicate glasses. So these are a very similar composition to Pyrex, if you have any Pyrex cookware. Um, but of course that doesn't have radioactive waste in it. Um, they throw in about 25% waste uh, loading, it's heat generating, we have about 7,000 cubic metres of it, and it's in uh, 5,100 stainless steel canisters that are this uh, shape, uh, and one of those is about the same size as me, so you can calibrate how much waste is in 5,000 of those. It's located at a, a big sort of um, hangar at uh, Sellafield. Uh, and under each of these uh, uh, lids uh, in the floor uh, is the potential to load uh, a number of these uh, vertically in the chambers and that temporary store. Uh, and it turns out that if you stand in this room, and I have, uh, you are um, standing on 95% of the UK's radioactivity. So that's quite exciting. There's lots of lead between you and it, so it's okay. Uh, that's a high level waste, intermediate level waste. A lot of our intermediate level waste is in um, cemented packages, or is planned to go in cemented packages. We do have quite a range of wastes, uh, so listed there, magnox, graphite, uh, 
sludges, degrading fuels, mixed beta and gamma wastes. Plan is to physically encapsulate uh, most of it in uh, ordinary portless cement, uh, pulverized fuel ash glass for and slag composite systems. Some of it might get placed in uh, so-called yellow boxes, which are uh, ductile cast iron uh, containers. Um, some, and I'll talk a little more about this later, is, will be uh, treated thermally, um, for example, using dual uh, heated uh, in cab vitrification. Uh, as I say, total package volume of intermediate level waste uh, that will need to go to a geological disposal facility, a repository, about half a million cubic meters. To date, and this is a slightly scary number, uh, we've only packaged about 30,000 square meters, uh, uh, cubic meters, sorry, and um, of course that's a lot less than 10% of the total. That we have uh, uh, packaged uh, is in about 50,000 containers or so, uh, stored on the surface at Sellafield, again in huge uh, stores. Uh, we have various uh, shapes of containers, uh, boxes and, and drums, and the drums can be stacked all together in a so-called stillage um, uh, for, for better uh, stacking in the stores. Uh, but, but it's, it's temporary storage uh, prior to uh, hopefully the permanent disposal in a geological disposal facility. This is some of the potential wastes. So, um, we're planning to stop reprocessing in 2018 and close down the thermal oxide reprocessing plant in the UK. That will leave us with some AGR spent fuel left over from our advanced gas cool reactors. We've got one PWR at size or B, so we'll have spent fuel from that. Uh, we've got lots of plutonium. I think the UK will, will ideally, if we build reactors, burn that in MOX fuel. Um, We've got some contaminated plutonium and uh, we're looking at various ceramic systems for immobilizing that. I know there's a lot of work done in that area here. Uh, we have a lot of uranium. Uh, my guess is that will get reused or, or sold at some point. So it's not really a waste. Um, and if we build the reactors, we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, PWR spent fuel uh, and possibly, I guess, now BWR spent fuel. The, uh, Katachi have come in and are uh, planning to build uh, four boiling water reactors in the UK. And of course, if we burn the mops, we'll have spent mops to worry about. So, the um, process uh, of waste management in the UK has uh, had its ups and downs, as in most countries. Uh, so, there were, there were several failed attempts uh, in the UK that, that led eventually to a decision in 1997 not to pursue uh, examination of the geology under on the Sellafield for a rock characterization facility. Um, so the government then uh, spent a few years deciding what to do, uh, set up the independent, independent Committee on Radioactive Waste Management, which reports directly to ministers, um, so that's quorum. Uh, they set up the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority to decommission and clean up the uh, contaminated UK sites. Uh, and the budget was 80 billion at that point, pounds. And then in 2006, uh, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority were given the additional responsibility of uh, implementing geological disposal, and they set up something called the Radioactive Waste Management Directorate to do that. The quorum, in its first uh, guise, uh, looked at the um, options for managing the UK's radioactive waste and it was a, a, a publicity exercise, a public relations exercise for sure, but nonetheless I think a very uh, valuable one, one that was needed. So they spent a couple of years and a few million pounds um, looking into what the options would be and perhaps unsurprisingly came up with geological disposal as the end point, what we should be going for. Um, and, uh, but while we're trying to get to that end point, we need some robust storage uh, provision against delay or, or, or failure in actually reaching the end point. So that was a core recommendation. Uh, we realised there was a need for expanded R&D uh, and we recommended a stage process uh, with flexibility uh, in decision making and, and the government working in partnership with communities uh, willing to participate 
in, in hosting a geological repository. So, so this is a, a so-called volunteerism uh, approach. And, and is in fact now the one that the uh, US uh, DOE are, are pursuing on the basis of the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations. Forum changed a bit um, once that, that those recommendations had come out. Um, became a more technical committee. Um, we were uh, our role changed. We were asked to provide independent scrutiny and advice to government on the long-term management of wastes. And um, so, so we're we're basically there to provide independent scrutiny, make sure the NDA are doing the right things, make sure the Department of Energy and Climate Change are doing the right things, uh, and that the core recommendations are followed. Uh, we have 15 members uh, on the committee. We are paid by government, which uh, make, makes our independence sound a little uh, dodgy. But actually, we we guard our independence very, uh, uh, very, very jealously. And the uh, government know that, so we're always having bus stops. <laughs> this is the MRWS process in the UK. It came out of the uh, white paper in 2008, which outlined the processes and the stages. Uh, so a framework for implementing geological disposal. So uh, stage one, uh, the government issued uh, an invitation uh, to communities to express interest. So this is a key phrase, express interest in hosting a repository. So no commitment, just expressing interest. Um, stage two is uh, some simple uh, sort of uh, tests done by the British Geological Survey uh, to see is there, are there mines, are there, there water aquifers, and have reasons why you can rule out certain areas. Uh, stage three uh, is where a community decides to participate, again a key phrase, decides to participate in the process. So at that point, uh, you can start doing more, ser doing more serious work, so desk-based studies, uh, and uh, then moving on to surface investigations of the geology in that area. And then finally, at stage six, the plan is for uh, underground operations. So, so uh, in stage five, you might be digging, uh, you might be putting boreholes down to look at the geology. By stage six, you're definitely digging down and uh, uh, starting to uh, build the repository. So we got to stage three, uh, and I'll highlight uh, uh, the progress to stage three and, and uh, where we're going to go next in the UK. So the NDA was established in 2005. Um, this was its, its terms of reference, really. Uh, they then were given the... Uh, the option of, uh, we were told they had to also do geological disposal as well as clean up of the sites. So they set up uh, RWMD uh, and incorporated the uh, previous body NIREX into that. RWMD um, was developed by the NDA, and the NDA is not a big body, it's an oversight body responsible for the site license companies in the UK. It employs about 200 people. Uh, RWND is a subgroup of that, um, and they, they, it was their role, it is their role to actually construct the GDF. Uh, they will become a wholly owned subsidiary of the NDA, and uh, when we have a site, they, they will become a site licensed company. So, this is the current situation in the volunteerism process in the UK. So, Scotland, as is normal, um, decided they wanted to be different these days, so they opted out of this MRWS process. Their policy is near surface, near site storage and disposal of Scottish waste, um, not deep geological disposal. Uh, they, they, they have, uh, I think about 25% of the Scottish wastes are not appropriate for near surface, near site storage and disposal. So I think uh, that's going to be interesting to see how that, uh, that pans out. So Scotland, a bit different. Uh, in West Cumbria, around Sellafield, uh, the two borough councils, so these are our small local councils, and the county council, which incorporates the borough councils, <coughs> other areas, including the Lake District National Park, set up the West, West Cumbria partnership, uh, and they expressed an interest we got to stage one uh, in hosting GDF uh, in 2008. Lots of things happened. The community were, were uh, consulted. 
there was an, an opinion poll in May of last year which actually showed that uh, the communities in those borough councils were all in favour. Something like 64% voted for uh, being, being uh, to pursue the option of geological disposal in their uh, districts. Shetway District Council, which is in Kent, uh, they looked at the possibility of expressing interest. Uh, Shetway includes the Dungeness nuclear power stations, one of which is, is uh, being decommissioned and the other is due to close down shortly. Uh, I actually went to the council meeting um, and they voted last year not to express an interest. And that was, a, for me, a particularly frustrating meeting because I was simply there as an observer and I wasn't allowed to say anything. Uh, and some of the things that were said were actually uh, wrong and factually incorrect, but I was uh, unable to leap up and down and say that's wrong. So, anyway, so they voted not to pursue it, which was unfortunate, I think, because I think the geology at Shepway, it's clay, it's the same clay as it were in France, where they have their underground research laboratory. Uh, it would have been a positive step. So the West Cumbria Partnership consulted their community over you know, four years, or more than four years, uh, and they had a big uh, meeting or a series of meetings of, of the two borough councils and the county councils at the end of January uh, and decided whether they would participate further in the process. Um, I'll tell you later how they voted. So the current UK, UK situation in nuclear actually is, I think, very positive. Uh, the infrastructure, the skills base is being reinvigorated. Uh, there's a lot of money from the research councils to support universities and research in general. Uh, the National Nuclear Laboratory um, is, is uh, based at Sellafield and run by Hotel Manchester University in Soko. There's a National Skills Academy for Nuclear, developing skills across the, 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 the piece from, from uh, uh, sort of. Uh, Technical, technician level through to uh, research, uh, postdoctoral level. There's a Centre for Nuclear Manufacturing, uh, which is at Sheffield. Uh, House of Lords have held a report, uh, an inquiry. Uh, Robin Grimes, my colleague from, from Imperial, was the um, technical advisor. I had to go down to the House of Lords and, and uh, uh, give evidence to their lordships, which was an uh, interesting experience. Um, and uh, I think we, largely we're making good progress. Uh, a lot of the decommissioning work is, is uh, moving forward. Uh, storage arrangements are, are looking good. Um, and the government has this nuclear national policy statement uh, which says effective arrangements exist or will exist. And that, that is a key catchphrase. Um, to manage and dispose of new build waste. So this is the government's argument for allowing us to go ahead and build nuclear power stations. So EDF Energy uh, are currently discussing with government the program to build four reactors, including starting at Hinkley Point. Um, but there's a sort of game of poker being played with the government because EDF, in order to uh, spend the, the huge capital expenditure that will be needed to, to build those reactors want the government to guarantee the price of electricity for a uh, number of years. Um, and we're also uh, going through the process of developing a generic uh, disposal system safety case. So even though we don't have a site or a geology, we're starting the process of getting a safety case for a repository. So that's this process. Um, it's closely regulated, so, so uh, all the regulators in the UK are involved in this. It's going to be a long and complex process, so that's why we started it quite early. Uh, the DSSC considers transportation, uh, construction and operation, and then safety in the long term. Uh, once you close it, the uh, size of the stack of paper in that DSSC is about this high. I know that because I printed them all off. Uh, we, we had to read them on the committee um, and comment on them. Um, and there's a lot of underpinning documentation. And actually, that, there's a lot of information in that, which is very valuable. Uh, and if you're working in this area, it, it's, it's all on the NDA website. OK, so that's a little about the sort of process, the volunteerism process in the UK and, and 
and, and the way we're moving forward. And I think we are moving forward. Well, we have some difficult technical issues, so I'll sort of move on now to some of the more technical side. We have a lot of poorly characterized and very heterogeneous wastes, intermediate level, uh, the, the cellophane legacy ponds and silos. So I'll talk a little about them. <coughs> We've got a lot of plutonium, um, mostly in the form of oxide powder, um, some of which is contaminated. But I'll, I'll focus uh, on the legacy ponds and silos. So there are four legacy ponds and silos and, and another highly active liquor how work, work stream. Uh, so the pile fuel storage pond, first generation Magnox fuel pond, Magnox source storage silos and the pile fuel planning silo. Those are the legacy ponds and silos. Almost four fifths of the major project costs during the next four years at Sellafield uh, go towards those. And they represent 90% of the nuclear hazard potential on the Sellafield site. So they are the UK's top priority in terms of cleanup and to try and make sure they are safe and secure. And, and a lot of money. Many tens of millions is being spent on them. So the NDA is focused on those and they have various strategy objectives. Just, just to accelerate the risk reduction of those high hazards, um, make sure the basic condition of the assets and facilities is maintained. That's just uh, a way of saying making sure that the uh, uh, ponds and silos are leaking. Um, reduce or mitigate the impact of the risk of a loss of containment, uh, prepare for retrieval operations, start retrieving the waste and immobilizing the waste. So there's a lot of interest in, if these are ill-characterized wastes, how can we get them into a solid waste form from a liquid sludgy uh, form? Uh, and and uh, so I'll talk a little about those in a sec. Just uh, focusing on the pile fuel storage pond, there's one example of our legacy ponds and silos shown here. So these were constructed in the late 40s and 50s, and, and uh, you know, considerations were a little different then. Uh, so they were left open to the environment, so uh, seagulls and things um, ended up inside. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of sludge in the bottom here. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a plan to build a local sludge treatment plant. Um, hasn't started yet, so, so the, the time scales for the, for the cleanup of these schools are, are measured in, in uh, numbers of years, uh, sometimes decades. Um, uh, but at least now we have a clear strategy and a clear way forward of dealing with these wastes. A number of, of skips uh, of wastes have been uh, uh, removed from them, uh, in this case the power fuel storage pond, so we are moving forward and doing sensible things. Um, this is a slide that I, I use in my lectures at Imperial College, uh, basically to illustrate the types of uh, solid waste forms and waste hosts, going from uh, purely amorphous glasses, so you vitrify uh, various uh, composition uh, wastes in, in glass. This is the French composition, this is the UK, this is the Russian glass. So this is fully amorphous over here, fully crystalline ceramics, uh, which may be single phase or multi phase, like the sin rock that was uh, developed in Australia. Um, and and uh, cement systems for our intermediate level waste, um, uh, these, these are uh, again multi phase uh, complex systems. Um, but, but sort of somewhere in between these crystalline and amorphous systems uh, are what I term glass composite materials which might be glass ceramics, uh, where you make a glass and then crystallize it in a separate operation, or a uh, melted waste form, um, such as the French are producing from their uh, cold crucible melters, uh, which has crystals in it, but is predominantly glass. Or you can develop a waste form where you have a very refractory, uh, crystalline, uh, radioactive material and, and encapsulate that in, in an amorphous matrix. So, so they're sort of between um, crystals fully crystalline ceramics and fully amorphous glasses. So there's been a realisation certainly over the last decade and, and longer uh, that these mixed crystal glass waste forms can be as durable as, as pure glasses. Um, 
And uh, we've been looking in the UK at a number of the uh, wastes from the legacy ponds uh, and, and trying to uh, develop uh, waste forms appropriate to them. But bear in mind they're quite heterogeneous and in many cases we don't actually know uh, too well what's in them. So one of those techniques is uh, to heat a in container vitrification. This is one of a number of thermal processes that's being developed at the moment, um, including pyrolysis, steam reforming, and, and, and hipping. Uh, and uh, so I'll talk a little about this. We've also looked at, at plasma melting in the UK, uh, and uh, cold crucible uh, induction melting has, uh, uh, is currently being used in France, uh, and uh, the Russians have looked at that. They're all at various uh, technology readiness levels, so some are uh, closer to use than others. So um, this just illustrates dual heater in container vitrification. So you put your, your mixed waste, which may have you know, bricks and finer material in it. Uh, you have uh, graphite electrodes in the corner. Uh, you heat it, uh, you get uh, dual melting, uh, and the product is a solid. Uh, waste, uh, which may be fully amorphous, it may contain crystals within it. But, but you've gone from something here which is not particularly good uh, to something that is, um, I feel, uh, much safer uh, in terms of uh, uh, waste. So the key issues with these thermal processes, and, and a number of countries are looking at these, <coughs> are the uh, you're, you're convert, converting these nasties uh, and combinations of sludges and organics and metals into uh, much more stable forms. Uh, so you've reduced the hazard associated with those wastes uh, dramatically. But you do need to worry about some other issues. Variable nature of the wastes, so controlling the process and the product is tricky. Uh, it's difficult to characterise the heterogeneous wastes and, and, and hence the products from them. How do you test the durability of a product that is heterogeneous? Uh, and so if you are uh, finding it difficult to, to test the durability, how easy is it going to be to convince the regulators that we should be able to put this in a repository? Um, so yes, there are difficulties and, and they're clearly illustrated there, but nonetheless we've gone from a nasty sludge in a uh, concrete tank um, to a solid material that is much more uh, much safer. So I think uh, you know, as engineers we have to be pragmatic about that and say we need to go ahead with that process. So that's the first sort of technical issue that I, I mentioned. Legacy ponds and silos and, and sort of thermal treatments. Uh, I want to talk a little now about package evolution uh, on storage and eventually disposal. So there are various storage concepts um, that people are looking at worldwide. So you can go for a high quality store, Rolls Royce store, such as the one at Hunterston where it's four feet thick concrete with re reinforced bars, walls, and, and uh, the roof. Uh, and the packages then may not need to be quite so durable. Uh, you can go for a lower quality store, uh, sort of shack uh, out back. But then you need decent packages if you're going to do that. Um, you can use wet, wet or dry storage for spent fuel and, and both probably. Uh, for uh, our high level waste, uh, we have a high quality store. I showed you that with the uh, uh, UK's 95% of its activity in there. But it's really uh, just a thin steel container. And you need to worry about whether you're storing the waste at reactor or if you're going for centralised stores. And, and of course, Spain has gone for a centralised store, the USA is looking at centralised stores, uh, and the UK is looking at centralised stores. Um, what eventually will come out, I'm not sure. The storage, I, I need to emphasise, is temporary. When you say storage, you are not talking about something that is going to geological disposal. It's disposal to me is permanent. I'm not a great fan of retrievability. Um, I think once you get this stuff down there, it's just something that you don't want to get back again. Uh, ideally, but of course if you wrap it in copper, uh, it might be beneficial to get it in a few hundred years because copper is valuable. Um, and we have lots of problems in the UK with people stealing copper. Uh, so I'm, I'm very wary of, of using copper as a... <coughs> anyway, um, disposal concepts. So, so again, storage is temporary, but disposal is permanent. 
near surface storage and disposal, the, the Scottish uh, option. Uh, that's okay for short-lived intermediate level waste, uh, for sure. Uh, permanent geological disposal, you definitely need that for your long-lived waste and your high-level waste, your heat generating waste, spent fuels. Uh, very deep disposal is certainly something that, that uh, Fergus Gibb, who was a colleague of mine at Sheffield University and on the Committee on Radioactive Waste Management, has pushed hard. Uh, and that's where you, you actually, geological disposal may be a kilometre down, very deep geological, maybe three or four kilometres down. Uh, and that, that then, there's no option for retrieval. Uh, and also you're below any sort of water flows and, and it has some uh, benefits for sure. So waste storage system. Um, so, so you may have seen this sort of multi-barrier concept and I'll illustrate that later for disposal. Well, of course, the same thing applies for storage. So your waste form is, is the uh, primary uh, barrier. Uh, your waste container to here is the secondary barrier. Uh, the store atmosphere and environment and how you control that is clearly important. And then your store structure, round about that, uh, is your final barrier uh, between uh, that waste and uh, the weather and the atmosphere. And we get lots of rain in the UK. Um, so, yeah. Penetration of salty rain in stores near to the sea is an issue. The packages inevitably will evolve, uh, they change, uh, and we really need to understand and control those changes in order to make a safety case for maintaining the stores. So this is a sort of generic shielded vault store, just to illustrate a couple of points. Uh, you might have your package, the intermediate level waste stacked up inside it, something like this. this obviously empty one. You have a lifting crane to shift things around, you control the environment in such a store, and you monitor uh, the packages and keep a close eye on what's going on. But of course, if your store uh, is, it has to be uh, in place and under uh, institutional control for hundreds of years, uh, at some point the, the, the crane will rust and you'll have to replace it. The control units on the uh, atmosphere, uh, temperature control and humidity, that you need replacing. And you know, I, I just feel um, long term storage uh, is, is, is somewhat um, undesirable. The packages evolve, there's a lot of research work going on in various uh, institutions looking at the sort of corrosion, not just corrosion from the outside of the package in, based on the sort of environment it's in, but also from the inside where the waste is out. Uh, and so you need to understand that, complex function, corrosion mechanisms, some of which is there. Um, some of the, the metals that have been embedded in cement are quite reactive. Interesting and exciting things that may be happening. I'll show some pictures later that suggest they are. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, research going on into those, those uh, waste forms and, and uh, current UK waste systems. So this is a Metron Magnox encapsulation plant. So it's got uh, uh, Magnox uh, um, cladding in a uh, cement inside there. Uh, it's a 500 litre drum. Turns out it was out of spec. Uh, and there was, uh, it is believed, excess uh, uranium in there, which has undergone expansile reactions. And if you look closely, you'll see some dents or some uh, protuberances in the drums. Each drum in the UK uh, is, is photographed before it goes in and they, they rotate it and make a film of it. Uh, it goes into the store and then every year they take out a small percentage just to check them and see what they like. And that's how they noticed uh, that they had some issues. So this occurred after I think 15 years uh, and was quite <coughs> unfortunate. So. Um, uh, the plan is that these drums will be repackaged and we'll have another layer put on the outside. Uh, and, and, uh, so while, while um, this is a concern, it's not a complete disaster, um, but it's not something that you would have uh, wanted to happen. So that's a little about storage and, and the issues uh, of concern to storage. Geological disposal, as I mentioned, we're talking about, uh, uh, in this case, hundreds of metres. Um, uh, more than 500 probably down to 1,000 
Uh, and as I say, that's what is recommended for um, disposal of the heat generating waste and the long lived intermediate, low and intermediate level. So the plan is this, this is uh, from <coughs> some of the uh, RWMD's documentation, surface facilities. Uh, because we have such a vast array of wastes, there will be perhaps spent fuel vaults, high level waste, vitrified uh, vaults. Uh, some, there will be some shielded vaults for some of the wastes and some unshielded vaults. So you go down, you know, right, right for spent fuel, straight ahead for high level waste. And um, <coughs> so you have a, quite, quite a complex uh, geological uh, and, and waste environment in that. This is the sort of multi-barrier concept of geological disposal for UK specific waste, so it's cemented waste on the left and vitrified waste on the right, uh, just to illustrate the various barriers uh, the, the, between the waste and the waste, waste form, uh, the package and the backfill material and, and eventually the geosphere in a geological repository. I think the key issue um, the, for the Committee on Radioactive Waste Management uh, at the moment is the, the geology uh, and the, the uh, and the geology has to be right I think. Uh, you can do lots with the engineered barriers around the waste but eventually after thousands of years they will go and <coughs> that, that waste material will, will access the geology and so the geology is a key, key component. Um, so it just shows the sort of evolution of cemented waste forms and, and backfill um, some, some, uh, of course, the, the repository itself will have cement walls and cement structures. So there's a lot of alkali generated. Alkali is generally quite a benign environment, but you do get a gradual degradation and eventual, uh, as the, the, the picture shows, release of gases, corrosion products, including hydrogen, which is never good in a repository situation. Uh, a lot of reactions between the cement and the waste. The sort of reactions that occur in vitrified wastes are illustrated here. Been well studied, uh, extensive work done, particularly in France and the US, uh, looking at the alteration of the glass, uh, the corrosion products that form. <coughs> People have looked at uh, accelerated testing to try and understand these corrosion mechanisms, and, and some of those are illustrated there. Uh, so you sort of get a, a, a once the water accesses the glass, uh, a, a gel layer on the outside, and, and generation of clay type products as well. Spent fuel will evolve um, so it's a ceramic uh, not, not designed to be a waste form but, but uh, uh, so for PWR it's uranium dioxide pellets, uh, pellets in, in uh, zircaloy cladding uh, in, in our AGR we have uh, stainless steel cladding uh, the radionuclides are all around the microstructure uh, distributed at grains and grain boundaries and the like. <coughs> Once the spent fuel comes out of the reactor, it may well be quite uh, different from the stuff that went in. So it's cracked, it's got uh, lots of interesting new species present. Uh, cor its corrosion rate will be a function of the burn up it's seen, the radiation to them, and the chemistry of water in which it comes into contact. When it does come into contact with water, you have a lot of readily accessible radionuclides come out, and that's the instant release fraction, um, mainly cesium and, and iodine, but in parallel, but at a much slower rate, the UO2 fuel dissolves, and you get sort of simultaneous release of some of the other fission products and, and actinides. We're also looking in the UK at what to do with our spent fuel packages, so we overpack containers, uh, and uh, one of the options, and I think a good one, is something called a multi-purpose container, which will be suitable for not only for storage, but for transport of that spent fuel and then disposal of that spent fuel. Um, so you don't have to repackage and change things. Sort of concepts that we're looking at in the UK, we know the sort of rocks we have, and we have a, a, quite, quite a, a range. Um, and the different concepts have been looked at in a large extent, so, so the sort of vaults, uh, what we should do with the spent fuel and the backfill type materials depending on, on the sort of rocks that you have uh, are illustrated here. I alluded to this and it is an issue for us in the UK, <coughs> co-location of, of, of 
different waste types in a single geological disposal facility. So there's clearly the potential for, over the long term, and it might be tens of thousands of years, interaction of the co corrosion products of the different uh, waste types, uh, which are in different parts of the vaults in, in the uh, repository. So you have a largely alkaline and intermediate level waste system, lots of cemented stuff, a neutral, perhaps slightly acid, high level waste bath system. So alkaline acid reactions, interesting things may happen in a few thousand years. So we really do need to understand the degradation, corrosion, product transport and interactions over geological times. So in the UK, uh, we believe on the committee that we need in situ experiments once we get a geology, once we get a site, in an underground research laboratory. Um, we're having an interesting discussion with the RWMD and the government who believe that you can do the research as you dig out the repository. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, I would point out, and uh, Robin Grimes would expect me to, that this is a real opportunity for the modeling community. Um, if you have difficult radioactive materials and the experiments are experimentally complex, and also you're dealing with long, long time scales and large uh, distances, uh, then use the modeling capability that we have. Okay, so I'll have that point later. Um, so, anyway, so, so I've talked about um, storage issues and, and uh, uh, disposal issues, uh, and sort of coming back to the, um, the, the, the social aspects and getting people involved. So the, the, the decision on January the 30th uh, was, was as listed here. So the Borough Council, Copeland, voted 6 to 1 in favour, and it was the Executive Committee who voted. Allerdale voted 5 to 2 in favour of moving forward, participating further in the process. But the Cumbria County Council, as I say, which includes uh, the Lake District National Park, voted against it. I think in large part because, well, uh, yeah, in large part because the uh, uh, there was concern over tourism and the impact of uh, agreeing to host a repository on uh, tourism in, in the Lake District. And because a previous energy minister had said we need three green lights, so we need at least one borough council, the county council and the government to agree, um, if we don't get three green lights then the process stops. And that's exactly what's happened. So you'll notice that that meeting was on January the 30th. 9 a.m. on the 31st, uh, the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change is in the House of Commons making a statement. <clears throat> so, um, what he said was, uh, the MRWS program continues, and uh, uh, I, I was already, I, I actually had to go to the uh, Channel 4 News studio, and I, I was supposed to be uh, uh, interviewed by Jon Snow. Uh, on the seven o'clock news, I was in the studio. I had my makeup on, which looked great actually. I kept it on for days after. Um, uh, and I was supposed to be first up three minutes past seven, um, but then the um, lady comes out and says, "Oh, we've got this person from uh, some some African country where there was a war going on. Uh, oh, and you might be on at twelve minutes past seven. So at twelve minutes past seven, she came back and said." <coughs> Sorry, you're, you're off. <laughs> no, I was quite disappointed because I was going to say lots of good things and, uh, about, about where we are in the process in the UK. But maybe it will happen in the future. Um, anyway, the government, as the uh, Secretary of State said, so, uh, uh, the government is committed to geological disposal. We, we really do think this is the only way forward. The uh, government is confident that the MRWF volunteerism process is sound and this uh, page 99 test. That's, that's the thing about, uh, uh, you know, will exist, uh, you know, a process will exist to deal with the waste, um, is, is satisfied. So they still think it will exist, even though we don't have a community. Uh, and of course, overseas programs have taken time to overcome obstacles. There have been problems. Uh, look at the US. Um, and the government is planning a new drive to find other communities to come forward. Uh, I mean, it is interesting, the, the benefits package um, for a community coming forward is a billion pounds. So we're talking a lot of money. And a lot of jobs for many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, at the same time, the government is going to reflect on the experience of this process. 
in particular the difference between single and two-tier local authorities. This, this business of the borough and county councils actually will surprise the government, even though the committee told them it was a problem and they should worry about it. Uh, and then there's this, this plan to reconsult to make process changes as necessary. So I'm slightly worried about that. You, you, you had the goalpost set and then it didn't work out, so you're going to move the goalpost. We'll see, but, but, but somehow we have to move the process forward. We, we can't stop. Some of the lessons that we learned with working, and the committee was seriously involved with the West Hungary partnership. Uh, always had members attending their, their meetings. It was a very complex process. It took a lot of time for the councils. Um, there was a lot of PSE, pub public and stakeholder engagement. Um, and it was very thorough. It was an enormous program in West Cumbria. Um, and, and maybe that was right. Maybe it was appropriate for this sort of first test of the volunteerism process in the UK. Uh, trust was an issue. We could see there was a lack of trust at various places. So the communities didn't trust each other. The borough councils didn't trust each other. They wouldn't talk to each other in the largest extent. The parish councils, which were even smaller than the borough councils, were fed up because they weren't involved. And all the parish councils were very anti because they weren't involved. You know. um, uh, the, the, the partnership didn't trust the government. Uh, they weren't too comfortable with the debt representatives and the NDA people. Um, and then the Treasury and Tech had a big bust up because uh, the Treasury weren't promising the money for the uh, benefits package. So the debt couldn't say to the community there's a big benefits package. And it was right at the end of the process when the Treasury said, yeah, it could be a billion pounds. But by which time the communities may have been put off. A lot of uncertainties in the process. You know, we don't have a site. So, so any site that comes up, and, and the geology is not well defined in West Cumbria, and it's not at, at these sort of depths in the UK at any place. We don't know. Uh, various people will come up, and that's the last bullet here, uh, who are anti-nuclear. Uh, geologists will come up and say, you can't possibly put it there, the geology is all wrong. And once they start saying that, and Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth jump on that bandwagon, the geology is wrong, it's not going to work. It's very difficult because what you can't say is, yes, the geology is right. You can say, we don't know. <laughs> We're going to look. And that's the process. The, process. the next step in the process is to look at the geology. At this stage, there's still no commitment from the, uh, from the communities. They can pull out at any stage, right up to stage six in the process. Stage six would be 20, 30 years ago. So these uncertainties about the, the inventory, you know, it's still not clear what, what will go in. Uh, we, the, the, the community at, at Sellafield don't want new build spent fuel going into the repository because they want to reprocess it. They want to reprocess a unit in Sellafield. Um, all sorts of, of issues uh, along with that. And, and clearly, tourism is a big deal in the Lake District, and, and it is an issue. It's something that people are worried about. Uh, so, th those are sort of lessons that, that, that we learned from being involved in this process. This was a key one. This, this final report was, was very long. Uh, this was the West Cumbria Partnership Report uh, that went out uh, last summer, and it was maybe 200 pages. And it really became clear to us that, that a lot of people hadn't read it who were the decision makers. And they were making decisions based on, on a complete lack of knowledge. And, uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, but, but people make up their minds about nuclear and they're going to vote irrespective of facts. So, my last slide. And actually, I think it, the, the story, in general terms, is, is good. You know, we're doing all the right things. Uh, but, but it is difficult. You know, the hardest thing is to persuade a community to, to host a repository. We're very transparent about our waste inventory. Uh, it gets updated and published uh, every two or three years. And we have a pretty clear vision in the UK where we're going with storage and disposal. A lot of good progress on the decommissioning program, clean up, storage, and disposal aspects. 
Clearly, the Sellafield legacy ponies and silos are the most challenging, and uh, we will be focusing more on those, I think, especially now the uh, volunteerism process is holding. Temporarily, I hope. I, I regard that as a blip, not a disaster. And much research to do, so uh, that's going to keep the universities and the research institutions busy, uh, particularly some of these difficult wastes, such as those in the legacy ponds and silos, and to really understand the sort of behaviour of the wastes in storage, and the waste forms in storage and disposal. Well, what is clear is that you need both a volunteer community and the right geology. Uh, and we may get, at the moment we've got neither, we may get a volunteer community, but there's no guarantee that the geology will be appropriate. Um, and then the argument's made where well, you should look for the best geology uh, as they're doing in Switzerland, and then say to a community, you're it, uh, you've got the best geology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that works either. So it's a very complex issue, it really is difficult. And you get people involved and people who have very you know, uh, clear opinions. Um, so I think that the, the technical challenges are enormous, uh, but we can solve those, we can do stuff. You know. Uh, getting people to do things that they may not want to do is much harder. So I do think the societal aspects are much more challenging than the technical. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>